So we are delighted to have with us today in our Bar Ilan University Vision Science Seminar, Professor Roi Mukamel from the School of Psychological Sciences and the Sagol School of Neuroscience at Tel Aviv University. Roi did his BSc in Computer Science and Biology at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and completed his PhD in Neuroscience at the Weizmann Institute of Science under the supervision of Professor Rafi Malach. During his PhD studies, he worked with fMRI and started doing collaborative research with Dr. Yitzhak Fried that allowed to examine electrophysiological recordings in the human brain. And these data led to exciting scientific breakthroughs, including substantiating the relationship between neural firing and the bold signal, revealing additional insights into LFPs, additional signal components, memory processes, and more. He continued this line of work in his postdoc at UCLA with Professor Yitzhak Fried and Marco Iacoboni. After his postdoc, he joined the School of Psychological Sciences at Tel Aviv University as faculty, where he opened and is the head of the Motor Cognition Lab. He publishes in top leading journals as Science, Nature, Current Biology, Nature Communications, and more. His research focuses on the relationship between perception, action, and motor skill learning using behavioral, virtual reality, and neuroimaging me methods in healthy individuals and in patients with motor deficits. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome you, Roi, to welcome you, Roi, to hear about your research today, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Sharon, for the invitation and for the introduction. So, um, like Sharon said, my lab uh, studies the links between action and uh, perception. And let's see if this works. Oh, okay. Uh, and we are interested in how the brain manages to produce effective actions uh, in order to uh, reach desired goals. And we know that this is a many-to-many -many mapping that is not entirely clear. So for instance, if I want to turn on the light, there are many different action commands that I can generate in order to reach this same desired uh, goal of turning on the light. So I can use my right hand or I can use my left hand. Uh, we know that in these uh, COVID days, we could open the doors with our elbows, right? So we could use different motor schemes in order to reach the same desired goals. The flip side is also true. So for a given motor command, there could be various sensory consequences. So in this case, I can uh, pull up the switch in order to turn on the fan or to turn on the light, okay? And the question is, what we're interested in is how the brain manages to map these actions or these motor commands to their uh, sensory uh, outcomes, okay? Uh, and the interaction between sensory pathways and uh, motor pathways. Now, the classic textbook uh, scheme tells us that we have visual areas and we have motor areas. Uh, each with their own um, specialties. But over the last uh, decades, we have seen that the borders between areas that were considered purely visual or purely motor are starting to get a bit blurry. So during my talk, I will address the relationship between visual or sensory pathways uh, in general and motor pathways. And specifically, I'll ask whether sensory regions are sensitive to motor attributes of the action. Okay, so in this case, when I turn on the light, okay, my visual cortex is engaged, but in principle, what should it, why should it care if I turn on the light using uh, different motor commands, right? Because the visual stimulus is the same. And uh, there's a good reason why we call it visual cortex, right? And the same is true for uh, the motor cortex, right? The commands are identical when I turn on the switch and the sensory consequences are different, but why should my motor cortex care, okay? Um, so 
Disclaimer, I'm not a pure uh, visual uh, scientist. Uh, so you'll see in my uh, talk, I will also allude and show data uh, from auditory cortex, but I will show also, of course, um, uh, things in the visual domain and hopefully uh, be able to relate between the two uh, commonalities and differences. So when it comes to uh, percepts and how they engage uh, our uh, systems, we know uh, from the discovery of mirror neurons back in the 90s that simple observation can elicit activity also in regions that are classically considered as uh, motor. And these neurons, or have been termed mirror neurons, have been shown in the macaque, in, in various lines of macaque, uh, also in the marrow set, and even in songbirds. So they are pretty much common in uh, um, various uh, species, you know, also various regions of the brain, not only the premotor cortex, but also primary motor cortex. And in humans, uh, during my uh, postdoctoral studies at UCLA, we worked with uh, patients uh, who had uh, intracranial electrodes implanted. Uh, so I had the chance also and the opportunity to record neurons uh, in regions like supplementary motor area uh, that showed these mirroring properties, namely that when they see, uh, uh, I show them an action, you see these neurons are active, but also when the patient executed uh, similar actions. Uh, and if we take it one step higher, not from just a particular region, and we look at the whole brain using functional MRI. So this is a study we conducted a few years ago where we showed subjects uh, different manual actions of finger sequencing, either using the right hand or using the left hand, shown here in the two colors. And in uh, purple, you can see the overlap. So what you can appreciate is that activity is elicited not only in visual regions, here in the occipital pole, in the parietal lobe, but also in frontal regions like the premotor cortex, and the supplementary motor area. So the bottom line, what I'm trying to say is that percepts engage not only sensory regions, but also uh, regions more classically uh, attributed to actions and execution of actions, okay? And this uh, made us wonder whether the flip side is also true, namely that executing actions can elicit uh, activity uh, or modulate activity in uh, sensory regions. And what we know in sensory regions is that indeed activity is not just a plain uh, response to the physical dimensions uh, of the stimulus but it is also modulated by internal states. It's basically an interaction between the physical properties of the stimulus in the outside world and our internal state uh, of the neurons. So in the case of binocular uh, rival rivalry, um, uh, the uh, stimulus doesn't change. It's constant on the screen, yet our percept is modulated every few seconds. Uh, the same is true for illusions, uh, like the necrocube, that we can either perceive it front uh, facing like this or like this. Nothing in the physical properties or physical dimensions of the stimulus in the outside world changed, yet our percept changed and changes, and this is due to the neural state of the perceiver. And this is another example from... Um, liminal uh, perception. So when you see the stimuli on half of the trials, you perceive it, yet in other cases, you do not, okay? So there are different uh, modulators that can affect neural activity in uh, sensory cortex, like attention, expectation, 
One of them is uh, voluntary actions, okay? And there has been accumulating evidence over the last um, couple of decades of how such voluntary actions modulate uh, neural activity and perception. So this is an example of uh, neurons in the auditory cortex of a mouse. And what you can see here are um, evoked responses, spikes, that are triggered either by uh, sounds that are externally generated, what they call here the random condition, uh, versus the evoked response when the mouse um, presses a lever or is in a specific, specific place uh, in the cage uh, that triggers uh, the action. So there's uh, an effect of agency. Okay, and the general um, result is that uh, self-generated actions evoke less activity um, compared to the same identical percepts uh, that are generated by someone else. So this is in auditory cortex, and the same is true in visual cortex. Um, this is a nice example. So the mouse is running on the treadmill in complete darkness, okay? Uh, so there's no visual input to what we call visual cortex. Nonetheless, we see these different types of neurons that modulate their firing rates according to the running speed. So on the left, there's a neuron that increases its firing rate as the mouse runs in a faster pace. On the right, you see another neuron that decreases its firing rate. And in the middle, there's a, an interesting neuron that has even some sort of a tuning curve. So it has an optimal uh, running speed, okay? Uh, so it's not just a simple gain that maybe the mouse is excited and all of his visual cortex is excited because he's running in the dark and he's afraid to fall, but uh, these modulations seem to have some pattern, okay? And these types of modulations have been uh, reported uh, not only in mice, but also in various uh, animals from crickets to bats, electric fish, uh, and uh, monkeys, and also in humans. So these are the EEG responses when the subject presses a button to trigger a sound, okay, versus when he hears exactly the same sound, okay, so the physical dimensions of the stimulus hitting the ear are exactly the same. The only difference is the agency. So here, the experimenter presses the button to elicit the sound, and we see these reduced um, uh, activity for the self-triggered uh, um, sound uh, in the EEG response, okay? So the underlying premise of all of these results is that uh, the motor pathways somehow modulate the neural activity in the various sensory regions. So given this premise uh, and that we know that the motor pathways are largely lateralized, meaning that controlling the right hand is mostly uh, by engaging the left hemisphere and vice versa for the left hand, we wondered whether these different sets of commands, okay, when I use my right hand or use my left hand, will also modulate sensory cortex in a different manner, okay? As if there's a fingerprint of the motor cortex that's engaged, and this is sent to uh, the sensory regions. So in auditory cortex, what we did, uh, we had subjects inside the scanner, and they had to play this uh, organ, this MR compatible uh, organ, uh, a short sequence of notes using either their right hand or using their left hand, binaural feedback. Uh, so when they play with the right or the left hand, the sound is exactly the same, okay? And then we recorded this and we replayed the same sequences 
uh, to them in a passive manner. Okay. And what we found is that in auditory cortex, there is stronger fMRI signals for the self-generated sounds. Okay, so this is already a global modulation of the active condition versus the passive. But when we look more closely, we see, let's say in left auditory cortex, okay, we see stronger modulations uh, when the contralateral versus the ipsilateral hand is playing. Okay, so when I play with my right hand, okay, the modulations in left auditory cortex are stronger compared to when I play with my left hand. Okay, so this is at the fMRI level and also at the behavioral level. So we had subjects uh, inside a soundproof uh, booth and they underwent an auditory um, threshold examination. And we see that, uh, let's say for the right ear, okay, so they trigger the sound either using the right hand or the left hand, okay? And when the hand and the ear are on the same side, they have lower hearing thresholds, meaning that they hear better compared to the condition where the ear and the hand are on opposite sides. Okay, and I'll talk in a second about what we think about is going on in terms of the hemispheres. We also uh, conducted uh, uh, an MEG study that gave us even better uh, temporal resolution. So in this case, uh, uh, zero, uh, so they had to press a button. Okay, and we introduced a delay of 500 milliseconds between the button press and the actual sound delivery. Okay, and this allowed us to separate signals that are more associated with the action from those that are more associated with uh, the sound. And what we see, so here they pressed only using the right hand, uh, and we see only in left auditory cortex, this uh, increased activity that is locked to the onset of the button press. And this evoked activity is absent in the right auditory cortex. Okay? So together, what we think is going on is that when I'm active, I press these buttons, okay? Let's say with my right hand, my left motor cortex is engaged, okay? And it sends these modulating signals to both hemispheres. However, the connections between or within the same hemisphere are stronger compared to the connections across hemispheres and therefore the modulations are different uh, between the two sensory cortices. Okay, so we see evidence for motor evoked activity in auditory cortex, okay, breaking this dichotomy of uh, sensory and motor regions. It's contralateral to the active hand, uh, and it corresponds with increased perception. So the sound uh, detection uh, thresholds were lower uh, when the motor cortex and the auditory cortex were within the same hemisphere. Okay. So this is uh, with respect to perception. And this is our working hypothesis that during playing with my left hand, for instance, so my right motor cortex is engaged. By the way, do you see my mouse? Okay. Yes, we do. So, so uh, we see stronger modulations in the sensory cortex or auditory cortex that is within the same hemisphere compared to those that have to cross the corpus callosum and reach the homotopic region or in the other hemisphere, okay? So next we asked, how does this relate to learning and integration of sensory and motor information? So whenever I learn a task, I have to integrate sensory and motor information. Uh, and the question is whether within hemisphere, we will see better learning compared to across 
hemispheres. Okay, and then it's not so far fetched. I mean, there are there is evidence, for instance, the Simon effect. Okay, that subjects, let's say, using the right hand, are faster to respond if the target stimulus is in the right visual field compared to the left visual field. Okay, so there are hemispheric differences, uh, or at least the configuration between the sensory motor cortices seems to be relevant. So in this experiment, uh, we manipulated the hands that are playing a sequence of notes, and we manipulated the ear that received the feedback. So we had uh, four groups of subjects. In each group of subjects, we had 30 participants, okay? And they had to generate the sequence of notes. Um, they trained on performing this sequence of notes within two metronome beats, okay? So the metronome is ticking and within each metronome beat, they have to do, perform this sequence of eight notes. Uh, and the interpress interval between the notes um, had to be exact at 300 milliseconds in order for them to be able to perform the task within the same, uh, within the two metronome beats, okay? So they train on this uh, for uh, two days, okay? And what we measure is basically the variability uh, from or the distance from 300 milliseconds, which is the, the desired uh, interpress interval. Okay, so if between the first and the second note, the uh, the time interval was 290, so the delta IPI, what we call, will be 10 milliseconds. But that will be true also for two notes that are separated apart 310 milliseconds, okay? So we look at the absolute value and not the average error, because if we take the average, it can basically, you can be, you can err on both sides and the mean will be perfect, okay? And that's not what we're interested in. So they practice this for two days uh, and we examine uh, their, um, uh, delta IPI as a function of, of the blocks. And the premise was that, okay, if the motor cortex, the engaged motor cortex and the auditory cortex are on the same side, within the same hemisphere, perhaps we will see better learning, okay, compared to the contralateral condition, okay. In addition, we thought that maybe in the contralateral condition, so basically I'm training a motor cortex of one side and the auditory cortex of another side, maybe we will see better transfer of knowledge from the trained hand to the non-trained hand. Okay, so if I train with my right hand and I give you feedback to the left ear, okay, so it's the left motor cortex and the right auditory cortex, Maybe if I test you after two days using your left hand, okay, because your right, your contralateral auditory cortex is already trained, perhaps the transfer will be better compared to the other group. Okay, so I know the left and right is very confusing because there are ears and hands and hemispheres. So feel free to give me a shout if I lose you in one of these uh, flips. Okay, so here what you see is the delta IPI, okay, for the for one group, 30 participants who trained using their left hand and ipsilateral, so it's their left ear. Okay, so the hand and the ear on the same side, the ipsilateral side on the left. And what we can see is that at first they are pretty much variable at 60, 60 milliseconds to either direction, but they learn, they improve. We see this learning curve, okay? And this is 20 blocks of day one, and this is 20 blocks of day two. We can even see some offline gains, okay? And they reach a plateau. And now the question is, for the same left hand in another group of 30 participants, what will it look like if they train with the left hand and the contralateral and the right ear? 
okay? So uh, in Zoom, it's a bit different, but it's difficult. But when I ask people in the crowd, usually they split 50-50 on uh, either uh, results. So I'll spare you the suspense. And this is re the result for the contralateral ear. And what we see pretty consistently is that uh, they reach lower uh, IPIs. They're more accurate in the condition where the left hand and the right ear, okay? So, of course, in order to nail uh, this result and to see that it's not just uh, something specific to the left hand uh, or the right ear, we also ran this, of course, in the opposite direction. So this is, these are the results for the right hand. In general, as you would expect, the right hand is better. So this is the right hand ipsilateral. So it's the right hand, right ear. Okay, and again, you see this learning curve, you see the offline gains, and there is some kind of plateau. But if we compare them to the contralateral group, we see uh, the same effect that the contralateral group, which is better um, uh, results compared to the ipsilateral uh, uh, condition group. Okay, so like um, one of my advisors in the crowd said, well, you know, the neurons never read your hypothesis. Uh, so uh, this is the fun part of science, of uh, having these surprises and uh, results that uh, are counter your hypothesis. Um, so this was for the con lateral configuration between the hands uh, and the ears. And we see that the contralateral configuration uh, is better than the ipsilateral one, okay? What about transfer of knowledge? Okay, so what I'm showing you here uh, is the performance of the non-trained hands. So we had before training and after training, we examined them on performing the same uh, task uh, with a hand that was not going to be uh, trained, okay? So pre-training, we see no difference between the conditions as you would expect. And post-training, uh, we see only for the left hand, those that trained with the left hand, that's also the hand that showed the stronger effect. We saw a uh, better transfer to the right hand uh, for the contralateral condition, okay? So those that trained in the contralateral condition also showed better performance post-training or transfer to the right hand, okay? So it seems that the lateral configuration between the motor pathways and the sensory port, uh, pathways plays a role in perception, neural activity, and in learning. Uh, and what we think is going on uh, is that, um, so in perception, we see that uh, same hemisphere results in better perception, but when it comes to learning, we see that this contralateral configuration uh, seems to be better in facilitating uh, learning. And when looking at uh, the literature, uh, we came across, across uh, this phenomenon called the bilateral processing advantage, okay? So if I give you, this is usually for difficult tasks. So if I give you two faces and I, I ask you, are they the same, yes or no, okay? If I present the faces to the same hemisphere, to this, in the same visual field, okay, people are slower to respond compared to if I present the two faces to different visual fields. As if when engaging both visual pathways in both hemispheres, okay, it facilitates um, the reaction times. And this was found for various uh, stimulus categories like words, faces, counting dots, okay? 
So it seems that for simple uh, response tags, stimulus response tags, processing within the hemisphere is indeed faster. However, for tasks that are more co complex, okay, it seems that using both hemispheres uh, facilitates uh, the responses. Okay, and uh, also when it comes to conscious processing, uh, we know that evoking activity in more real estate, okay, and in both hemispheres uh, is more correlated with conscious processing. Uh, and in our case, uh, it seems to facilitate uh, learning. So as promised, now to the visual uh, domain, okay? So we wanted to examine whether these kinds of phenomena that we found in the auditory domain also hold in another sensory modality, namely vision. And the advantage of vision is that we can separate the visual fields and engage the hemispheres in a separate fashion as much as possible. So for instance, when pressing a button to elicit this visual stimulus on the right in the right visual field. So if I use my right hand, okay, so my left motor cortex is engaged, okay, and it will send efference copies or modulate activity in the left visual cortex, okay? But if I elicit exactly the same stimulus using my left hand, okay, so in this case, my right visual cortex is engaged and these motor commands will need to cross the hemisphere, okay? And like in the auditory cortex, perhaps will modulate the activity in the visual cortex in a different manner to the extent that we will be able to see differences either in perception or in neural activity. Uh, and this is a project that was led by uh, Batel Boron uh, from the lab. So we had two conditions. Uh, we had either a uh, passive condition in which we show the stimulus on the screen or right afterwards uh, an active condition in which, in, in which they have to press a button in order to elicit exactly the same uh, stimulus. And we asked them which of the uh, two stimuli is brighter. Okay, so we're examining differences in contrast and uh, unbeknownst to the subjects in 90% of the trials, there's actually no difference between the stimuli, they are identical. Okay, so we want to see whether generating the stimulus with the right or with the left hand will change their perceptual biases, okay? So what we count is the proportion or the number of trials in which uh, they say that uh, stimulus two, for instance, is brighter than stimulus one. Uh, and we uh, compare to 50, uh, which is chance, okay? And we do this separately for the two hands, okay? Uh, and what we see is the following. So when stimuli are presented to the left visual field, we see stronger modulations, stronger changes in perception uh, when subjects trigger the stimuli with the left hand compared to the right hand, okay? And for stimuli presented in the right visual field, we see stronger modulation, perceptual modulations at the behavioral level when they triggered it using uh, the right hand compared to the left. Uh, so again, we see this um, laterality bias like we saw in uh, the auditory cortex and what happens in the brain. So we had a visual uh, localizer. Okay, so we focus on visual cortex and we perform our uh, decoding for the two uh, hands. And what we see, so in red are voxels, significant voxels that um, decoded, okay, or separated, discriminated 
right hand uh, trials versus left hand trials, okay, when the stimulus was in the left visual field. And in blue, we see um, voxels separating right versus left hand when stimuli were presented in the right uh, visual field. So there are two things that I want to bring to your attention. First is the fact that we are able at all to decode the hands from activity patterns in visual cortex, despite the fact that the visual stimulus was identical throughout all of the tribes. Okay, so this is one thing. The second thing, which is interesting, is that, for instance, if you focus only on the left visual field runs, okay? So only my right visual cortex is engaged. So in principle, I would expect that all of the modulation would occur in my right visual cortex. However, what we see is that these red voxels in this case, are found not only in the stimulated visual cortex, but also in the left, the non-stimulated visual cortex, okay? So it seems that the different hands uh, send these unique fingerprint efferent copies, uh, not only to the stimulated visual cortex, but to both cortices um, similar, okay? And if we look at the decoding accuracies, uh, so if we uh, average across all voxels or look at the peak voxels, it's very significant and in some cases can reach 80 and 90% classification. So we see that voluntary actions modulate perception of self-triggered visual stimuli. And this modulation is in a hand-dependent manner. Okay, and at the neural level, uh, we see that uh, representations in visual cortex uh, depend on the stimulus triggering hand. So in a sense, your visual cortex is less visual than what you think. Uh, and it actually encodes not only visual percepts, but also the hands that were used to trigger the percept. And in some cases, even when the visual, the visual cortex is not stimulated, right? In the ipsilateral visual field, ipsilateral to the visual field, we still see these modulations, okay? So what could be the fun functional role of such uh, modulations. So this is an ongoing project that we're running now uh, with Guy from the lab. So we put subjects inside the scanner uh, and we use an MR compatible tablet and we have them trace these uh, shapes. So we have two shapes in the entire uh, experiment and the conditions are either active tracing of the shape Okay, or uh, trace viewing, which is basically uh, a replay of active traces. Okay, and the question is whether in visual context we will be able better to discriminate or to decode uh, stimulus one from stimulus two in the active versus the passive. Uh, condition, okay? Uh, so, so far we have uh, 12 subjects. Uh, we're aiming for uh, 30. Uh, and what we see uh, are in green is the localizer for the visual pathways. And what we see in uh, blue are the voxels that decode or discriminate between the two shapes uh, during the passive condition, the trace viewing. And in uh, red are voxels that discriminate between uh, the two shapes in the active condition, okay? Uh, and, Oi, yeah. may I ask a question? Sure. 
so this blue uh, where you find the viewing, uh, the, the trace of the viewing classification, is it only in the um, left hemisphere? And I mean, the stimulus was not um, in the right hemisphere necessarily, no. or was it? No, the stimulus was, was, stimulus was central. We see the voxels in both hemispheres, the blues. Okay, mm. it's just a mm -hmm. matter of uh, threshold slice of the slice. Yeah. Oh, I see. Okay, and ah, okay, good. And <laughs> and uh, and does it overlap with red voxels, or is that just um, an illusion? So that's a perfect question. So I, I'll go to the questions. Okay. Maybe. So um, yeah, the question okay. is whether uh, the two overlap, right? Uh, and how do they relate to each other, okay? So what we see here uh, on the x-axis is the mean classification or percent of uh, classification across all voxels in the ROI, okay? Uh, this is in the passive condition, and this is in the active condition and each circle is an individual subject, okay? And what we see by and large is that classification of objects, uh, the visual objects is better in the active condition compared to the passive condition, okay? And this is an average across all of the voxels, okay? Regardless of their classification, okay? If we do introduce a threshold, Okay, let's say 70% classification between the two shapes. We see more voxels that pass this threshold in the active condition compared to the passive condition. Okay, so from both analysis, it seems that uh, the active condition uh, yields better classification and more voxels that separate between these two. Um, conditions, okay? And with respect to uh, the overlap between the red and the uh, blue, it's still something that we need to quantify. Like I said, this is ongoing, okay? But we do see uh, nice overlaps between the active and passive conditions. Thank you. Okay, so now that uh, we have examined the, the issue of um, sharpening of tuning curves, the question is whether these types of modulations are unique to voluntary actions, okay? Could it be that whenever I press a button, I already have an expectation in my mind, a desired intention of the sensory stimulus that is the outcome of my action, okay? So perhaps any type of expectation could result in similar types of modulations, okay? So what we did, uh, what we are doing in this project uh, with Batel is to compare motor modulations, motor expectations versus those that are induced by um, a sensory cue. So let me explain what I mean. So here the subjects generate, this time it's a central stimulus in the center of the visual field, and they trigger it either by pressing a button with the right hand or with the left hand, okay? So here we see our motor cortices, relevant motor cortices that are engaged, and we will examine modulations in visual cortex. Right, okay. So this is basically something that I have already shown you, this part of the puzzle. But now we add another condition where we provide an auditory stimulus, okay? Either to the right or to the left ear, okay? Now for an auditory stimulus to have any kind of predictive value, there needs to be some temporal difference between the cue and the sensory outcome, right? So we give them the sound, okay, to one ear, and 600 milliseconds later, the visual stimulus appears, 
Okay. And the same is true in the motor condition. Okay, so they press a button and only 600 milliseconds later, the visual stimulus appears. And we train them on this contingency um, for quite a few trials, okay? So that they uh, can estimate very accurately uh, the temporal difference between the cue and the target, okay? And we examine neural activity in visual cortex. And as a reminder, the visual stimulus throughout the entire experiment is the same checkerboard in the central uh, visual field. Okay, so this is the behavior of that. So these are our localizers for the motor cortices and for the auditory cortices. Uh, and I must admit that I wasn't expecting such nice laterality in the auditory cortex. Uh, the textbook always says that, okay, while visual cortex is highly lateralized with the visual fields, auditory cortex is much less because it's much higher in the hierarchy. So this was also for me kind of a um, curiosity, um, but nonetheless, we see very nice uh, differentiation between the right and the left ears. Uh, at the cortical level, okay? And the question is what happens in the various conditions uh, for uh, the different cues? So before I show you the results, maybe what kind of results can we expect, okay? So if the motor condition, voluntary actions are unique in the sense that they send these special modulations that say agency, I am the actor, okay? And they tell that to visual cortex. Then we would expect to see these lateral differences in visual cortex only in the motor condition, but not in the auditory condition, right? If on the other hand, uh, these types of expectations or modulation signals are not unique to motor cortex. It's not necessarily agency. Then perhaps, because the auditory cortex is also lateralized, then we should see, we should be able also to decode the ears in visual cortex. Okay. In that case, it would be interesting to perhaps examine whether the motor and the auditory signals share similar modulatory mechanisms. And how can we do that? We can train a decoder to separate the right and the left hands and examine it on the right and left ear conditions. Okay, and I remind you, in all cases, it's always the same visual stimulus appearing on the screen, okay? So this is our visual uh, localizer. And these are our uh, voxels that discriminate between the right and the left hands. So this is in a sense, uh, a replication of our previous result. Uh, the only difference here is that, while in the previous study, they pressed the button with the right and left hand and the visual stimulus appeared immediately on the screen. Here, the visual stimulus appeared only 600 milliseconds later, right? And now the question is whether we will see also for the auditory condition or, or the ears, right? And these are the results so far from 12 subjects. Uh, again, we're aiming for 30. And we see a separation uh, of the ears, okay, in visual cortex. So if the predictive cue was delivered to the right ear or to the left ear, despite the fact that the visual stimulation is exactly the same, we see discriminating signals uh, in visual cortex. Okay. And if we compare both so far, uh, we see some overlap, but also some differences uh, as if the uh, ears and the hands induce their modulations in different regions or different voxels, okay? Um, that's one thing. 
It will be interesting to see in the voxels that overlap uh, whether we can perform cross decoding. Okay, so if we can train a classifier to separate the left and right hands, and it will be able to discriminate the right and left ears, it would suggest to us that the two types of modulations or predictions share a similar mechanism. Okay, and this is something that we haven't done yet, but it's in the pipeline. Um, hopefully in a couple of months, we will have all the data collection and we'll be able to answer this question. Um, and we also had a condition where subjects press the buttons or received auditory cues, but there was no visual feedback, okay? And what we see so far in a visual cortex that we see traces of the neural signal of the hands and the ears, even when there's no visual stimulation. Similarly, similar to what I showed earlier, when we stimulated only one of the visual fields. We saw that even in the non-stimulated visual field, we see these discriminating signals between the hands. So the motor cortex sends these modulating signals um, in a hand-dependent manner, but it's not unique to motor cortex because we see that also the auditory, the ears, send um, these left-right signals. So um, we see that motor cortex can shape the activity in visual uh, areas. And the question is, what can we do with this um, more at a practical level? So this is an uh, uh, exciting uh, collaboration that uh, we hope to start soon together with uh, Professor Pavan Sinia from MIT, who gave a talk in this forum uh, several months ago. Um, so uh, Project Prakash, uh, he works with children that are born with cataract, uh, so they are practically blind until relatively late age. Uh, and then they um, uh, the cataract is removed and they receive uh, visual input. And now they have to learn to see. And the question is whether we can engage the motor system to facilitate this learning curve, okay? To help them in learning um, visual processing, okay? So if I showed you earlier, it seems that the motor cortex can help in sharpening the tuning curves, discriminating between two shapes. Perhaps by um, training through uh, active engagement, active tracing uh, could um, facilitate uh, the learning curve. Okay, so. We're anxiously waiting to hear the results of the NSF BSF grant that we wrote, but hopefully if we get it, <laughs> we will be able to examine these kind of questions. So how am, am I with time, John? Is there... Basically, um, it's five to four. Um, if you can wrap up in five minutes or so, um... And if not, that's also okay. I mean, some some people even stay later for the discussion, so it's okay. okay. We can okay. we can do it. It can. I try no. to run through it. Yeah, don't. Uh, uh, yeah. And if there are but questions, but don't pressure yourself too much. Okay, so hopefully I convinced you that sensory regions are sensitive to motor attributes of the actions, and now I want to convince you that the motor commands are sensitive to attributes of the evoked stimulus, okay? So if I press this switch and I'm expecting the light to turn on or I'm expecting the fan to turn on, like I said at the beginning, why should my motor cortex care, okay? 
But what we see is that it actually does care. And there are subtle differences in the kinematics of the action already to begin with. OK, so at the neural level, uh, we had the subjects press buttons, and the buttons either elicited the sound or uh, did not elicit the sound. And the subjects were trained to know the mapping uh, between the two buttons, and they freely pressed them at their own will. And at a certain time, we switched the mapping such that this button that previously elicited the sound now is silent and vice versa. So now we can look at the same button, okay, on the trials where it elicited the sound, they expected it to elicit the sound, and indeed it did, compared to the brain signals when they pressed the same button, but no sound was expected or delivered. And we focus on the signal called the readiness potential in frontal regions. And we see indeed that there is a difference between the readiness potential for trials in which the button press elicits a sound, okay, compared to the readiness potential in trials where the button press uh, was basically silent, okay? And they know in advance whether the button will elicit a sound uh, or not. And this project started as some kind of uh, negative control uh, in which, I talked with uh, Daniel Resnick, uh, the PhD student. Let's just verify that when they press the button with sound, without sound, they press it similarly, just to, you know, review a three. The answer is, uh, and lo and behold, we find subtle differences. So uh, this is already uh, a continuation project uh, with uh, Batel. So we had them, this time we used force uh, sensors, okay? And we measured the force that the subjects apply to the buttons when the buttons are associated with the sound or without the sound. Um, and in some of the blocks, they knew the contingency. So, um, um, and in other blocks, the contingency was random, okay? So my confusion, it's not with sound or without a sound, but we used two different sounds, either a louder sound or a softer sound, okay? That's, uh, and what we see that when they know that they're generating uh, a faint sound, this is how their uh, button press, the force trajectory, uh, looks like, and this is the sound, 300 milliseconds. I think he's frozen. Yeah, I think he yeah, probably OE is... Um experiencing um, some internet issues. I hope yeah, he will come back soon. I'm going to pause the recording. Did I? Um, um, you were- Back in, well, the, back in yeah, the 90s. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so right. we saw, we saw, well, I saw the first, um, the first line, like, and then I, I don't remember seeing the other, the other ones added, but yeah. Okay. okay, so when you expect a loud sound, you press with less force. And when you expect a faint sound, you apply more force, okay? So it's like when you press the elevator button and it doesn't come, then you press harder because you're not receiving feedback. <laughs> this is basically what happens. And if you don't know what to expect, that's the random condition, we see that at least for the first 100 milliseconds, there is no difference. And the difference that comes up later could be reafferent uh, signals. So here we focus on the first 100 milliseconds on the four, and the force values in the first 100 milliseconds. And what we see is that for the faint intensity, when you expect a faint int intensity, you press stronger, you apply more force 
compared to when you expect stronger feedback. And this is the results for the um, random condition, okay? There's no difference between uh, the force applied, okay? So we examined this also um, by flipping the causality, okay? So same condition as before, but also, but also when they have to respond to either loud or faint stimuli, okay? And we check this in different modalities, both the auditory, visual, okay? And uh, tactile, so we had vibro tractors uh, on the hand. And basically what we see is a similar thing. So this is a response to the um, salient condition, the force response uh, across 72 subjects in all modalities. And uh, this is for the faint uh, response. So they apply more force when they expect the amplitude of the stimulus, the intensity of the stimulus to be uh, lower, okay? What happens if we flip the causality? So you hear a sound now, and now you have to press, okay? So you either hear a faint or a loud sound, and you have to press the button. So in general, you apply more force because we think now your button press doesn't elicit uh, a sound, okay? You don't have feedback. And we don't see, I don't know if you can see it, but basically the lines are overlapping. So there's no difference in the force you apply for the faint or for the uh, salient conditions. Uh, and just for the sake of time, uh, I'll run through this uh, quickly, but the bottom line is that we see these effects in the separate modalities, the auditory and the tactile, but we do not see it in the visual condition. Uh, and this is one place where we see a difference between the visual uh, modulations from motor cortex compared to other modalities. And we still don't have a really good explanation for this. We tried different, it could be, you know, when it comes to sound, you know, if I hit the table stronger, then I expect stronger, more salient auditory feedback. We couldn't think of an equivalent in visual in the visual domain. The only thing we could think of, so, so in our experiment, it was contrast, these Gabors, okay? The only thing we could think of was maybe visual motion, right? So when I walk faster, then the optic flow is faster. So what we did, we also ran another batch of 24 subjects where they press a button and they know that the Gabor will either spin slowly or fastly, okay? But also in that condition, we did not find any difference in the amount of uh, force that subjects apply uh, according to their expected speed of stimulus rotation. So this is still an open question, a puzzle that seems that the visual system is a bit different in the sense compared to the, the auditory and tactile. Um, so to wrap up, uh, so this is basically what I said. So we see that sensory regions are sensitive to motor attributes uh, of the actions, okay? And also the laterality, right? The left or the right hand that elicited this um, stimulus. We see that also motor commands are sensitive to attributes of the evoked stimulus. Uh, we see this in the force. Um, and the lateral configuration between the motor and sensory system seems to play a role in perception and in learning. And as I mentioned, perhaps, I mean, this is the goal of our lab to try and harness the perceptual system and the motor system and their configural relationship in order to facilitate learning. So we're trying to use this with various uh, devices, including virtual reality. 
So this morning I gave a class for the first time in the metaverse. Uh, we have a class uh, here, we have a new uh, VR center uh, uh, on campus and uh, I give a class on virtual reality. Uh, and the class was in the metaverse. So all the students came, they put on the head mount displays, their goggles, and we had one of the students give a PowerPoint presentation in the metaverse. So we were all avatars and the student's avatar was showing us uh, the paper that we were discussing. So, uh, so I started the morning in the metaverse and now I'm continuing to Zoom. So I'm covering all aspects of uh, technology. Um, and like I said, we're, so we're trying to harness perhaps also the motor system to facilitate uh, perceptual uh, learning. Okay, and with this, I thank the lab members and you for your attention and uh, that's it. Oi, thank you very much for a lovely talk. Um, so I want to ask everybody to unmute yourself and let's give Roy a big um, um, thank you. And of course, we are going to be opening uh, the stage for questions. I can already guess who will be raising their hands. Uh, but um, so I, I, I'd like to... Um, start by um, asking, first of all, about the, la I mean, I've got a few questions, but I won't um, burden you with all of them, but uh, regarding the last aspect that you said that you didn't find yet, um, influences of, um, of uh, or differences in the vision, how the vision affects force. the force that is applied. So I wanted to ask if um, you measured thresholds I mean, do you know whether, for example, maybe you were, maybe the Gabors were, um, maybe there's an issue of the sensitivity. So maybe, um, I don't know. So I'm just uh, uh, lowering the sensitivity, lowering the threshold or something like that, or matching it to somebody's threshold would maybe um, uh, force, force them to uh, exert more force uh, when it's, hardly seen i don't know uh, how that um so all of the stimuli were above threshold in all modalities mm, were okay. above threshold. so you hear it uh but it's you know not too loud versus louder also the louder one was not aversive okay so it's well within hearing range or tactile sensation range or visual range i mean you always see the gabor uh, mm -hmm. Also in the um, in the low intensity condition, okay. Okay. Uh, Thank but you. we didn't do individual uh, thresholds. Okay. So, yeah. Okay. But I guess okay. So I'll I'll keep on thinking about this. <laughs> so we had these constant levels that we use across all. We we verified with them before we started that we perceive them and everything mm. is fine. So we didn't play with um, detection levels. Okay, okay, interesting. Lovely, okay, Rafi is, um, um, yeah. Very nice, Roy, as usual. Um, in this uh, experiment where you have modulation of the visual stimuli by, by motor, mm -hmm. uh, you didn't mention, uh, where is it mapped on? I mean, is it early visual cortex? Is it foveal, periphery? High order. Uh, it was difficult to see from the sections. You have any any yeah. kind of uh, feeling for that? Yeah, we didn't do a retinotopy, uh, so we don't have the retinotopy. Um, and our stimuli were pretty low level. I mean, uh, so it was either a gray patch or um, checkerboard grating, uh, and it seems that it includes uh, low-level regions. Okay. Is that... Uh... Thanks. Um, before we continue to the next um, uh, to the next um, uh, question, I just want to say that Sarite Shapiro and Galia Avidan said that it was a great talk, but they had to leave and they apologized for that. So just not to miss out on that. And... Um, 
I'm not sure, Peli, is it Eli Peli? I'm not sure, but um, you, do you wanna? Um... Yes, it is. Okay. <laughs> so so should, should I go on? Yeah, I mean, sure, yeah. if it's okay with Oi. Yeah. I'm... Yeah, okay. Um, sure. So I read it as Roy, because I don't know Roy. But now I understand <laughs> where Roy comes to Tel Aviv University. Uh, <laughs> Okay, uh, so I want to start first with the result that there's no effect on the visual, mm -hmm. which seems to sort of work against your wish to affect perception or vision, especially in the in the cataract uh, project uh, upcoming. Mm -hmm. um, so within within my my general. Uh, view of this is that the model system is very trainable and very uh, learnable, and that. that's how it functions. And mm -hmm. in various situations, such as prism adaptation or whatever, we really train the, the, the model, not the visual. And so training the visual is um, a target, a goal for many of us, at least in this environment. Uh, and uh, it's significant results are reported, but they are minuscule and not really valuable. On the other hand, in motor, we know people can learn to play music, ski, whatever. And the, the play music is combination of auditory and motor skills. So this is just in, in regard to, it's just a comment in regard to the longer goal. So I'll, I'll be waiting to hear the results uh, from uh, Sina uh, Bawan's uh, experiments. Hopefully, you'll get the grant. Now, the for the the presentation or for the results that you presented, you have, as far as I could tell, two measures. One is the uh, the response measure, the threshold measures, and the other one is the uh, fMRI measures. Mm -hmm. And the fMRI measures, um, to me, are suspect that there is a blood flow. They're measuring blood flow. And if there is blood flow in that hemisphere mm -hmm. um, due to the motor response or for whatever, that may affect the result and look like tuning, but it's really just that uh, some of the blood flow went the other way. Um, I'll have to look at the results very carefully to see if it's consistent across all the conditions. And hopefully you can tell me that you did that and it's not. But uh, but the, the problem with that is that it's not really an isolated, you're looking there, but the blood flow elsewhere as a result of the, the paradigm may affect that. And for the uh, sensory response or uh, thresholds, there's a similar kind of potential problem with the timing. The timing that the response or the activation gives the, the user an exact time in which they can uh, narrow their uh, attention, if you want, I don't like attention, but their determination of when there was a signal and therefore uh, reduce the noise and get a better response. So it's not really uh, demonstrating a modulation, but rather using that action to uh, restrict the their range in which they take the measurement. And it's been a very long question, so I'll stop. So regarding the first one, yeah. uh, whether it's just a blood steel, Right, if I understood the question correctly. Say again. So whether it's just blood st steel between the hemispheres. Yes, yeah. Whether a blood flow that is activated or taken away for the action is what is being modulated, but not not the neural activity. Yeah. It's so have to be shared now. The yeah. same. So, uh, first of all, I cannot, I can never rule this out, but there is substantial evidence 
um, from the Logothetis lab, also uh, my work with Rafi in uh, uh, auditory cortex, that there is a coupling between the physiology and the fMRI signal, in at least in sensory regions, um, in visual and in auditory, uh, in subcortical and cerebellum, maybe the picture might be different, but uh, at least in motor cortex, uh, the works of Hermes from UCL, uh, our works with Rafi and Fried, uh, we show coupling in visual and in auditory cortex between the fMRI activity and underlying physiology. Uh, I'm not worst... disputing that. I'm, I'm sorry. I, I think you may not understood my question. I'm not disputing that the fMRI has correlation or uh, is a result of the changes in the fMRI as a result of physiological and neural activity. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is that the neural activity of the motor is drawing blood flow mm -hmm. that will change the fMRI. And that blood mm -hmm. flow that goes there may change the blood flow in the visual because of availability. And therefore, it may look like a change in visual activity, but it may just be a change in blood flow yeah. under the same visual activity, but because some blood flow went elsewhere. Yeah, uh, I see. What, uh, well, with my measures, I, I I cannot rule that out. Okay. Um, Roy, are you up to more questions or? Yeah, I'm good. <laughs> okay, so um, so I do have another question with respect to the uh, results that you've shown uh, more in the more beginning of the talk where you discuss the issues of the crosstalk between or crosstalk or the ipsilateral versus contralateral um, hemispheres. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to ask uh, one thing is about the cerebellum, which I know that is not that is involved. I mean, I don't know much about the cerebellum and whether it's um, involved on uh, in a preparing or planning actions, but it could also, I mean, I know that the laterality of the cerebellum is the same as the body and not, it doesn't. Yeah. So I don't know if you've examined um, that or not. And I also wanted to ask about the, um, if the results could be also related to pro probably some uh, within hemisphere or cross hemisphere um, interferences. So if you have, uh, or, uh, interferences or um, fighting for resources with just uh, some ideas, different thoughts about uh, yeah. these. So uh, regarding the cerebellum, it's an excellent question. We haven't thoroughly examined it. Um, so I don't have an answer uh, at this point, at least. Mm -hmm. uh, what was the second? Uh, Regarding interference, is it something? Yeah, about? yeah. Interference. Whether whether the issue of you know uh, fighting for you know I mean resources are eventually limited. So whether it may be yeah. an issue of I don't know limited resources or um... yeah. So that's exactly what the bilateral uh, uh, where I have it. Oops, the bilateral processing effect basically talks about that. So if you present the stimuli to both hemispheres, you can process them in parallel. There's less interference. Yes. And integration somehow occurs later. Mm -hmm. So resulting in faster response times and better accuracy. And, yeah. OK. Thank you. Rafi, do you have another question? Well, if you ask, I forgot to take it off, but still, if you ask, I, another issue is you, you talked about increased brightness when you have this uh, effect, mm -hmm. but uh, I wonder if you saw an effect of temporal, in other words, faster, um, like a faster delay, a shorter delay between the 
the motor and the sensory um, uh, effect mm -hmm. uh, in one case versus another. In other words, that it doesn't only affect the the brightness, but also the the delay. Because if it takes longer time to cross hemisphere, maybe it will slow down the the effect or something like that. I don't know. It's just a thought that I had. I don't know. Yeah, uh, there are some studies that uh, they see. Um, differences uh, in response times and in the EEG evoke responses depending on the configural relationship. Yeah, between, exactly. uh, yeah. yeah. like the, the effect is around five to 10 milliseconds. And do you, see, do you experience it visually? I mean, you, you saw, it appears faster after the, after the button press, for example, or something like that, or you don't? Uh... We haven't asked them, uh, but um, I would find it hard to believe that they would perceive such a small difference. Yeah. Okay. So, um, Roy, I would like to thank you for a really great talk. And um, again, thanks very much for joining us um, and presenting these fascinating results. And um, I also want to say that I join Ellie in wishing you um, success in getting this grant. <laughs> and I also want to say that um, with respect to the planned project, that yes, both uh, Pawan Sinha gave a talk and it's on our YouTube channel. And also Shlomit Benami, which is here and is taking part of this. She also gave a talk That's way nice. back. Hi, Shlomit. Mm -hmm. And it's also on our YouTube channel So um, of the seminar. So you're uh, everybody's welcome to watch it. Um, and yeah, good luck to all of you. Um, and next week we will have here Stephanie Rossit from London, uh, who is also going to talk about stuff related to uh, vision and action. So everybody's welcome to uh, join. And um, thanks again, everybody for joining. And thank you, thank Cheryl, you Roy, again. for organizing all of this. Really, <laughs> uh, a great forum. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, thanks to all of you. <laughs> thanks. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Bye.